So the next day, for some reason, I just happened to run into Melvin Bell. And I said, Melvin, I want to tell you something. You know, we played you three times. Y'all got a good team. Got a good manager. John Patrice is a great guy. Probably a lot better guy than I am. Doesn't have a lot of ambitions. As far as he's concerned, all he's willing to do is just play right there in Upton. Every once in a while, make a 15-mile trip. We are going to be state champions. I'd like you to be a part of it. We will be whether you are or not, but you can help us come along a lot faster. It took Melvin a long time, about two seconds. He said, I want to play for you. And man, what a player I got there. This guy could bunt, steal, hit. He could play three positions and he could fight. <laughs> man, could he fight. We always said if there's ever a fight breakout, we were going to win. All we had to do was just get out of Melvin's way and let him take care of things. But that would stop a whole lot of the harassment among the young guys with Melvin being on our team. The trash talking seemed to just die down once they found out that Melvin was there. And then this picked up the team that much better. And now we went through that 68 season getting better and better and better. We were wanting to play in the state tournament in 68. In order to do it, we had to win the district. And we had to play it at Cave Springs. And we had to play against Glendale. And we had to play against Ray Smiley. And Ray Smiley would beat us for the fourth time that year. And we had to sit back and we watched Glendale go to the state tournament. First team that would represent our league in a long, long time. And Ray Smiley went up and made a good showing. They lost the first two games. Ray Smiley gave up two runs in one and one run in the other. And the team come back and completely disabandoned. Three weeks later, I heard about it. And the first thing I did was try to go get Ray Smiley. And he said, Coach, I've already promised Perryville. And I, it's, my heart sunk, but I said, man, Ray, keep us in mind. Anytime you get disillusion, we'd love to have you. I think you'd work great to our team. He shook his head, okay. But I was able to pick up some other players, one other player from that team. We had this classy left-handed first baseman kid, Madkiff. Man, could he play. You talk about leather. He could show you the leather. He was already about 36, 37 years old at that time. I went to him and I said, Ken, I really need you. You know, the leadership you can offer to us. And he said, Coach, I'm going to tell you what I'll do. I'll give you two good years. He lied to me. He gave me two great years. What he meant to that ball team. Oh, the leadership. The... The thing about him, he was six, about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, had those long arms, and it was just a statement to all the infielders. Don't worry about making a good throw. Just get it in the neighborhood, baby. You can turn it away, that double play. Just get rid of it. It's in the dirt. I'll take care of it. Over my head, I'll take care of it. Up the line, I'll take care of it and tag the runner, and I'll make it look easy. You won't even be noticed that your arm is a little scattered. That just picked us up a whole lot right there. Now... Another guy from Upton, Melvin Bell's cousin, Norman Riggs, comes along and he wants to play. And all oh, could we use him. He could do the same thing. He could play four or five different positions. We welcome him. Now we're getting a little stronger. Then a kid named Dewey Riggs. Dewey Riggs comes along and he'd just gotten back from Vietnam. He is also a first cousin to Norman and Melvin. So now we got a little family affair come in there, and they wanted Dooley to come in. They told me how great a player Dewey was, and I'd never seen him play. But we welcomed him with open arms, and oh, what a kid he was. He enjoyed life. So many times on point, and so many close calls in Vietnam made him really appreciate the U.S. and the freedom we have here. He would set out with a glove just a little bit smaller than his hand. He would holler, good shot, good shot, good shot. He could play that infield. He could hit the ball. <laughs> we were sitting there one night. I'm waiting to give infield to our team. The other team was out taking infield. Dewey comes running up to me. Coach, 
not going to be able to play tomorrow night. Not. We had a three. Game, we had a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday schedule with some good teams. It was Friday night. Can't play tomorrow night. Can't play Sunday. What's the matter, Dewey? Getting married. Marrying Bob Walters' daughter. See her up there. Ain't she pretty? <laughs> I said, Well, Dewey, why didn't you? Aren't you supposed to be at a at a rehearsal tonight? Aren't y'all having a wedding rehearsal? Nah, I'm gonna play ball tonight. Do other things later. Can't play ball with you the next two nights. We're going on our honeymoon. And where are you going to live at? I'm not a telling you. You're one of chivalrous. Not going to tell you. You ready to take some infield? I'm ready. The other team runs off the field. We take the infield. The second ground ball I hit Dewey took a bad hop and hit him right in the groin. Not trying to be a prejudiced person. The only way I know how to describe it. Do he look like a Muslim praying to Ollie? Up and down, up and down. His bride to be, Patsy Walter, soon to be Patsy Riggs, jumps up from the bleachers, looks out in horror, and said, Dewey, I told you this was going to happen. Dewey, then, true story. Dewey got okay. His honeymoon went all right. And he began to play with us. And so now we had Ken Madcalf at first, Dewey at second, Lenny at short, Wayne at third, Freddie was still the pitcher. We could catch Melvin or Norman. We could play others in the outfield. We had Gary McDowell in center field, and we had Leon Jaggers in right. And we had some bench strength. We had some of these kids like Allen and others, and Travis and Mike Swigler and Jackie Wallach. They were happy to be with a team that would be ready to play at any time. So I see this team, so I made this real tough schedule. We would go to Indianapolis, we'd go to Terry Oak, we'd go to Nashville, we'd go to Columbus, Ohio, we'd be out on the road. And then this team just started growing together whenever we got out on the road. We'd have to spend some time in the hotel, sometime we'd have to put three different families in a room. The kids were being coming along. And I can still remember seeing Betty Jean chasing Paula Jean. Paula Jean's about 14, 15 months old. Betty Jean's trying to catch her. Paula Jean's got on nothing but this diaper. Not a huggy. Not what are all the other things they have today. A regular diaper. One of them kind you shook out and then you hung up. You washed and you hung up and used again. She's got this diaper on and she's running trying to get away from Betty Jean. She's got a wet spot in front and a lump in the back. And this lump in the back is just about ready to pull that diaper off the hips. And Betty Jean's trying to get there before she gets there. And all the women are in the stands laughing about it. And they're having to share milk and we're having to pool money together to get back home. And we're sitting there and we'd be playing one of these tournaments. We're playing in Terry Holt, Indiana. And it's on a Sunday. And we're playing our fourth game of the day and it's dusty and it's dark, you know, and it's starting to get dark and the lights are going to come on. We're in the loser's bracket. Guys are tired, and you look out there, and Gary's got the big hole in his pants where he'd slid in two days before, and he's got scab on his knee where he's tore it off three or four other times. And all the guys are standing out there weary, and we're down four to nothing. We ain't got a good call all day. Every 50% call has gone against us to the other team. And you look, and you sit, and you think, well, we don't have to show anymore. They know who we are now. When we walk in, they used to say, Bonneville, where are you guys from? Now when we walk in, they know who we are. We don't have anything to prove. And I guess the best thing, just go ahead and lose this game. Because even if we win it, we got to win three more just to get into the winner's bracket of the of final. If we play all the way through and we win this thing, games are going to be over at 2.30 in the morning. Now we got a four-hour drive back home. we got some guys that got to go to work at 7 o'clock. Yeah, that would be the easy thing. Just forget it. Let it go. Let's get on the road. But then you look out there and you see those jaws tighten. And you see them grit in. And then you see somebody say, come on, Freddie. Come on, boy. And then energy just starts picking up. And then you know what they're thinking. No, hell no, we don't quit. And then they get out, and here they come with just a little extra hustle into the dugout. And I jump up, and I said, okay, we're down four. We got Lenny batting third, Norman batting fourth. You two guys get on. 
if we uh, we'll get a couple of pops out of these guys, we'll get it tied up, and they will not score another run. We'll win this game. And here they would come from behind again, one more time, play two more games. Then we would get home completely broke, and we'd have to go see our parents because we didn't have any money. We done spend it all. We got to get by for the year. Nobody had a good job. We just had adequate jobs. And here we are paying money right out of our own pocket to do a thing we love out on the road. And we're coming closer and closer and closer together. We are family now. We are brothers and sisters. And the kids are all playing together. And everybody has that love for each other. And we would go and we'd talk and then we'd have to hear that lecture from dad and mom. You know, you're a grown man now, you got kids. I mean, why do you have to go so far away to play? Can't you just play here at home? I mean, you know, you got a family to raise now. They got to be educated. They got to be clothed. They got to be fed. And you have to agree with them because you're needing that money so bad. But when it comes Friday, on the road again, here you are out with those kids. And that just grew us together. And then that year, yep, Mr. Check, Neil Armstrong in 1969 took that first giant leap for mankind. And the Bonneville Bombers are going to the state tournament. And it was another thing that happened in the Skaggs family in August of that year. On August 11th, our second son, Jason, was born. And that really messed up all of our practice and our plannings. But today I figure it's all well worth it. But here we are to go into Walton, Kentucky. Everybody had so much thing. Everybody was short on money. We decided we would drive up there the night of the game and then we would get to hotel rooms. Got to remember, nobody has won from this league in a state tournament ever. So we're not supposed to win, and especially since we're playing the host team and probably the number two or three team in the state, Walton, Kentucky. So we drive the three hours with only 10 players and we pull up with about 30 minutes before game time and something happened, we've only got eight. Norman and Leon are not here, where could they be? We started warming up, they'll be on shortly, shortly. Seven o'clock game time, they're not here. I go up and I tell the officials, we're waiting on a couple of players. Well, that's tough luck, you gotta forfeit the game. If you don't have nine players start the game, you lose. Walton had seen us play on the end, they wasn't particularly happy about having to play us. And that would have been an easy win for them, a forfeit. And I argued back, no, wait a minute, you got 15 minutes of grace period. Don't think so, this head umpire would tell me, and the tournament manager, and of course, Dean and uh, Lloyd Poor, the two brothers were manager and pitcher were agreeing with them. And I said, look, of course in those days, 1969, no cell phones. We're gonna to have to drive over town. I wanna to call the commissioner. The commissioner tells me that you got 15 minutes grace period. Now they stop and they done the math. By the time we go to town, get on the phone, get a hold of the commissioner and get back, 15 minutes is gonna go by anyway. So they said, okay, you got 15 minutes. So here we're waiting. The team is waiting, waiting, waiting. And they start counting it down. 10 minutes, five minutes, three minutes. Nobody has showed up. Freddie Hodge had quit warming up pitching. He's walking, everybody's hoping we don't have to lose this game by forfeit. We're watching, now it's one minute, 45 seconds, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and a car comes around the school. It wasn't them, but they don't know it. All right, I said, there they are, let's play. I'm ready. Wait a minute, we gotta flip a coin here. We don't know who the home team is. Now I know we can't be the home team because we got a bat, we can't take the field. We don't have nine players out. So they go and they flip it and the guy calls it tails and it lands on heads and they said, Bonneville will be the home team. That's not gonna work. So in my best redneck hick impersonation, which wasn't hard, 
I said, no, wait a minute. We won the flip. We get bats first. And the umbar looks at me like, are you, coach, are you telling me that you want a bat first? I said, why, sure. He said, change that. Walton will be the home team. They take the field. I got Melvin Bell leading off, and I'm telling him, we got to stall. We got to take as much time as we can. So he's stepping out, looking down for signals on every pitch, and I'm going through some. And this third baseman named Donnie Wallace, he's looking at me. He said, Coach, he's a leadoff batter. It's nobody on base. What kind of signals could he be looking for now? He knew that, of course, I was telling I said, well, you know, this boy is a little bit greedy. I got I to gotta teach him a lesson. He's waiting for me to give the home run signal where he can hit a home run. And I said, I'm not going to do it this early in the game. I'm just not going to do it. Now they really know. They got some. We were able to hold on. And here comes Lenny and, I mean, Wayne and Leah. Just show up just as we made the third out, put on their spikes, run out to the field. And then Freddie, without any warm-up, we give up seven runs. Seven runs. Freddie got warmed up then. And then he stopped him right there. Third inning, we pick up two. Then three. And then in the last inning, in the top of the seventh, we had the bases loaded with two outs, and Lenny Highball hit this screamer that Lloyd Poor caught. And we lose the game seven to six. The next day... Freddie Hodges would win five games in the state tournament. That got us all the way to playing for second place in the loser's bracket. But once again, we met Mr. Ray Smiley for Perryville, and we were defeated. And the first time ever in a state tournament, Bonneville Bombers had a record of 5-2, and two, finishing third. Well, that year was over, and now... People had hope. People began to see that it's possible we could win the state championship. So at that time, I went to Ray Smiley immediately again and told him how much we needed him, how much we wanted him, and I think with him with us that we could be the state champions, maybe the next year. He agreed, and he says, you know, it's a tough thing because I, I played with Perryville and we had a good team. And I've got to make a decision. It will be you, them, or you. But you can understand if I don't, don't come to you and I decide to play with Perryville again. I told him I could understand, but I really would love to have you. He said, I'll let you know sometime in April. Uh, before you make your schedule, get all your scheduling done, I'll let you know. Well, I thought of another thing. Wonder why Bonneville couldn't just host the state tournament too. Not only would we, if we had Ray Smiley, or we didn't have Ray Smiley, we would play it on our home court, our home field. So I told some people that I was going to go and talk to a commissioner in Frankfort, Kentucky, James Moore, and I was going to try to make the bid for Hart County and make the bid for Bonneville. And again, I heard, useless, impossible, not going to happen. Can't be done. I was stupid enough to think it might. And I went. And I talked to James Moore for like three hours. And he was very inquisitive. And he said there'd never been a tournament down there. And he wanted to know why. And I told him, I said, well, I think it would be good for softball for one reason. You don't have many teams down in our area. Most of your teams are South Central Kentucky. They're in Lexington, Walden, Ashland area. I think it would generate some interest. I think it could do a lot of other things. Well, what about your facilities? What about your hotels? Well, we have only two there. But Elizabethtown is like the hub of the city. It's the hub of the state. You got Interstate 65 going one way. You got the Blue Grays Parkway going the other. And from Elizabethtown to our ballpark, you can be there in 15 minutes. Now, when we play in a state tournament at Lexington or Walden, where we have to stay, we're talking about 15 minutes, even though we're in their town getting to the ballpark. Made the best pitch I could make and didn't really know where it was going. But at least I had some ray of hope. He asked, what about, what about 
if uh, you know you got to pay expenses, can you uh, we give the winning team five hundred dollars? That's a lot of money, a lot of money in nineteen seventy. Yep, we can do it. We can take care of that. Okay, I'll be in touch with you. It's three or four teams that's wanting to bid. I'll let you know. Hello? Mr. Skaggs? Yes. Ah, Mr. Skaggs, this is James Moore, Commissioner of Softball. Yes, sir, Mr. Moore. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about you maybe hosting the state tournament <clears throat> uh, down in Bonneville. Uh, I'm down to three sites, and you are one of them. And I was just wanting to get some things cleared with you. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Uh, first of all, the financial aspect of it. <clears throat> I need you to understand and to know <clears throat> that, first of all, you have to have at least $500 uh, for the winning team. You will have to pay for all the softballs that would be used. You will have to also pay... Uh, uh, for the trophies, and we will send those to you with a bill, and they will be uh, of our choosing. Uh, we will also, uh, you need to know that all the umpires have to be sanctioned, and you must be able to take care of all that. Now, we're figuring uh, probably with the teams there, and we don't know exactly how many teams, somewhere between 12 and 16 teams in the state tournament. <clears throat> Uh, your expense is uh, going to be running somewhere around uh, twenty-five to twenty-eight hundred dollars. Uh, now, would, are you sure that you would be able to take care of that? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Moore. I'm, I'm sure that the people here in Bonneville. Let me ask you a question or two. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, first of all, would we be able to charge admission? <coughs> yes. Uh, are, are you, how much would you charge? Uh, well, we were thinking maybe charging 50 cents per head. <laughs> 50 cents, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, now, we don't charge ball players or their wives or girlfriends. It would just be the people come and we would charge them 50 cents. Also, we would like to make a program where we do some advertisement sales. And uh, that would kind of help us. Would we be able to do that? Oh, yes, sir, as long as it has the ASA logo and it is uh, cleared through me and the ASA. Uh, all right, sir. Then I don't think any we would have any kind of a problem. And if need be, uh, I could send you a cashier's check or a money order or whatever you need uh, tomorrow or the next day. <coughs> oh, no, sir. No, no, that, Mr. Skaggs, that wouldn't be necessary. I just wanted to make sure that you could. Now, let me ask you some other things. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, would you be able to have a protest committee there? Yes, sir. Uh, and you would have a three-member protest committee? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Mr. Skaggs, uh, are you sure you know what a protest committee is? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, well, then uh, I'd like for you to explain to me what a, a protest committee is. Yes, sir. I'd be glad to. Uh, in case uh, something should come up as far as a misinterpretation of a plan rule or the uh, umpire failure to apply the cor correct rule, uh, the manager for the protesting team has a right to have a protest. Now, unlike the protest that would be happening during the season, this is a tournament game, which means play would have to be stopped. The manager would act as an attorney or he could have a representative, anybody on his team, to act as such. And he would go before this three-person protest committee, and he would lay out what he thought the umpire made their mistakes in. Those mistakes would have to be misinterpretation of a plan rule or failure to apply the correct ruling. Once he is able to uh, give his uh, representation or uh, his speech, why he thinks it's wrong, the other team would also have a right uh, to rebuttal. And that could be the manager or it could be anybody that he represents. Whenever they get done, uh, then this three-person committee 
would vote and two of the three votes would decide on how it is. It's final and nobody else has any other opinion about it. Mr. Moore? Mr. Moore? <clears throat> yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Skaggs, I want to tell you something. Uh, I've been commissioner 15 years. I've asked that question maybe 300 times. You're the first person that has ever been able to answer it. And on that alone, Bonneville will get the 1970 state championship men's face pitch tournament. You've got it, and I'll be in touch with you. I hung that phone up and I said, yes, yes. And then the phone rings again and I'm saying, oh my God. Surely he hadn't changed his mind this quick. Hello? Randall? Yes. Ray Smiley? Ray, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I just wanted to call and let you know. I'll be pitching with you guys next year. Ray, you've made my day. I tell you what, you're going to love these guys you're playing with. And we're going to make a great team. And I think we're going to win the thing next year. You're going to be the first to know right now. I've just heard from Commissioner Moore. And we will be hosting the state championship at Bonneville next year. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, I'm looking forward to playing you guys. Listen, Ray, we have a practice this Saturday at 2 o'clock. We probably won't be practicing much. We're just going to sit down and talk about the schedule. We're going to have a real tough schedule. And a whole lot of it is going to be with some tournaments at Bonneville where we can not only, uh, you know, play tournaments, but also get used to playing there and running a tournament because I'm going to have to wear two hats. I'm going to have to be a tournament manager and the manager of the future state champions. So we'll be looking forward to seeing you.